Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. And uh, tonight we're going to have a little bit of fun as we go through some of the factors and uh, some of the great things that we have here as coaches, as leaders. And there is a poll that has been active, and I appreciate you filling that out. It gives me a good understanding of where people are coming from and what they actually coach. So tonight we're going to talk about the coaching sins, the things that we do many times that we don't really mean to, but we make the mistakes. And as coaches, as leaders, as catalysts for other people, one of the greatest opportunities we have is to learn to gain the wisdom and the growth and the development so that we can push through, develop, and overcome to provide new opportunities for those that we lead. And so tonight I'm going to go through some topics, some of the mistakes that we make, and then I've got an offer for you that's completely free and something that I think you'll appreciate. And more importantly, um, something I think you're going to gain a lot of information out. But you have to stay to the end, which I'll talk about in a minute. So let's get started. Um, let me do a general housekeeping. If for some reason my internet lags, my Wi-Fi connection hiccups, just hit the refresh button at the top. Um, that is the easiest way to reload. I'm going to keep speaking and talking. Um, because on my end, it's hard for me to tell. Um, I appreciate you're here. Um, I'm going to try to keep this to 40 minutes at the maximum. Uh, and that way, if there are any questions at the end, that we can answer them. If you do have a question, you can enter them in the chat. Um, and yes, this is a live broadcast. So I'm I'm going to leave this. Um, if you have any questions in the chat, you can put them up there and I'll answer them as we go forward um, and be able to answer those questions at the end. So the seven sins of coaching and what you can do to avoid them. These relate to anybody who is responsible for coaching and leading another individual. That's the coaching model, right? We want to develop people. We want to provide them opportunities, and we want to give them the ways and the focuses of um, the way that we go about doing stuff to see the growth of an individual. The greatest opportunity that I have as a coach is to see somebody who's facing a challenge and to provide them with the tools necessary that they figure out a way to overcome and learn the process. That's the brilliance of coaching. And that's the that's what we all want to do, right? We don't want to open the doors. We want to teach them how to knock on them and how to knock them down themselves. That's the brilliance of coaching, to face the insecurities and the doubts that we have to go from there. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Today's discussion, I want to talk a little bit about why coaching philosophy is so important and how it can help you. Um, I want to talk about some developmental case plans um, and, and really some tangible strategies that I've learned over the years of working with coaches um, and some of the differences between rules and standards that have developed. And lastly, maybe some tools to tap into the individual players um, and to their psychology, their developmental aspect, what makes them unique and them develop, and more importantly, how we can grow and, and, and push them through some of their own learning strategies that are there but done so in a healthy and supportive manner. Um, there's a bonus at the end, and I'm going to share a file with you. Um, this is a ebook that I wrote. This is what this webinar is based on, The Seven Sins of Coaching. These are the seven most common mistakes that I see coaches make and what we can do to avoid them. And the reason why this book came about was I had individuals that would reach out to me, and, and I kept hearing the same trends and the same um, really patterns develop. And those patterns are well-meaning. They're not mistakes that we make because we're being deviant or we're deciding to make mistakes, but instead it's the patterns that we make. You know, it's the mistakes that we make that really create more difficulty. And if we can eliminate or improve our mindset as we go into that as coaches, as leaders, we can help navigate through them. And I'm going to share that at the end of this webinar so you can download it. It's completely free and I hope you enjoy it. Give you a little background on me. Of those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Dr. Brett McCabe. I'm a clinical and sports psychologist, which means I'm trained in the clinical side, which is the understanding of the human domain from wellness to illness from a psychological standpoint. And I specialized in really the multidisciplinary teams of the medical settings, working with people across a lot of settings to help a patient get better if they had medical conditions and then the psychological coping that went with it. Obviously, I was always interested in the sports side because I was a college baseball player, um, and I learned through my own trials and tribulations what it took to succeed and to overcome because I had to focus on the mental game. Um, the cool thing is 
as we're recording this, this today is the 30th, no, 29th anniversary of our first national title at LSU, which I was very fortunate to be a part of. So go Tigers into my 1991 LSU baseball Tiger teammates and fans. Go Tigers. Glad to see that. Now, that being said, I'm also the sports psychologist, the consulting psychologist for the University of Alabama Athletic Department. So roll tide. And the cool part about that is I get to interact with coaches across the entire coaching domain. Coaches that are the head coaches all the way down to the graduate assistants and the student assistants, helping them understand what the best way to approach players. And the great thing is how they can tailor what they do to match the psychology and the developmental uh, process of each player they're working with. The days are gone that we treat all the players the same. You know that. But I want to teach you why that's so important from a psychological standpoint. And I hear coaches tell me all the time, Brett, I don't, I don't feel like I should tailor everything I'm doing to every player I coach. Well, the problem is you're already doing that to the ones you struggle with. You're tailoring a process and it's usually a wrong one or out of resistance and frustration. How about if we turn that and we get you ahead of that game? That'd be a great way to do it. And I'm a, the performance psychologist for 12 players on the PGA Tour. Um, I work with variety in the golf world and I also have professional athletes across other sports. I do a lot of my work on the PGA Tour, also the LPGA Tour. And it's a cool job because each one of them are different and the way that they see their game and their competition is completely unique. So here's my question for you. Do we have a coaching crisis in today's world? I would argue that we're on the brink, okay? And the brink of that coaching crisis is the fact that we are evolving and developing as a unique process of how we go about the way that we interact with our players. I think it's needed. But I also think it's left a lot of coaches struggling with what to do and where to go. There's no doubt in my mind that coaching is one of the most difficult professions that we have. You're responsible for inspiring, motivating, challenging, and teaching people to overcome barriers and limitations. And that also speaks to resistance and fear, as well as dealing with individuals who may have had negative experiences in the past. They have histories of drama or trauma with coaches, and trust may be an issue. Our job as a well-meaning coach, a catalyst for change, is to see the opportunities that they, that they have within them and tailoring our process to reach them. But the reason why I think we have a coaching crisis is coaches are stuck. They're not sure what to do. They're not sure, sure what is right and what will be later deemed as wrong. If we look back in the coaching model over the last hundred years, it's been a dramatic shift in the way that we've motivated. We went from a very authoritative and very disciplined heavy coaching model over the last hundred years to one much more of empowerment and engagement. And some coaches would even argue today that the coaches are not in charge anymore. That many times outside influences are the ones that are calling the shots. Coaches often coach in fear of parents and parents' rebuttal to their administration. And if you look on the power of social media, which is an extremely powerful mechanism for developing personality and status as well as sharing information, coaches are often stuck or being disciplined or even terminated based on information that is being shared. Even at the time, if they didn't think it was inappropriate or wrong, and maybe at the time it wasn't uh, being resurfaced later to saying, ooh, that was probably inappropriate and cross the line. So what I'm saying when we have a coaching crisis is that a lot of individuals in the coaching world, what they tell me is my intentions are pure. My intentions are what I think the right way to do things. I want to help a player reach their greatness, but I'm scared and I'm worried to do the wrong thing. I get it. I understand it. And we have to empower our coaches, you included, to have the tools and trust that it's coming from the right perspective and it's developed and resourced to change, inspire, and motivate those that we're working with, okay? Now, the calling of a coach is great. I know throughout my life, I've been very blessed to be around and here because of some very influential coaches that I've had in my life. By no means was every coach that I had that, that I look back at with a positive outcome, um, really a positive experience. I may have had a positive outcome because I withstood it, I endured it, and I learned something from it. My mom and dad used to sit down with me and always explain that our job is to learn the lesson of every interaction and relationship. 
It is not always the outcome that is our learning, but it is something that we gain through the interaction. I've had coaches that I did not like. I've had coaches I did not trust. I had coaches that I could not wait to get away from. But I also had coaches that inspired me. And through some of those that I didn't enjoy, it inspired me to never allow them to be responsible for my future again. Now, I'm not calling them out. They may not have understood that. But I also had to realize if I'm sitting on the bench and I'm not competing, I don't want to ever be in this position again. What do I have to do to earn a role, to start to play more? What do I need to do to overcome maybe the limitations or the barriers that are being placed in me? Because I took the idea that nobody can stop me from improving. And eventually, I want my improvement to be so loud and my performance to be so noticeable that nobody can keep me off the field. But I had to go through those pains. I had to go through those challenges in order to understand that. Your job of a coach is to motivate players. But what motivates them? Do you know the individuals to coach them, to teach them the necessary skills, to share the wisdom that you have in your years of experience in the game and coaching players over generations, to help them tap into their potential that many of them don't even see or understand that they're capable of achieving, to develop them so that when you see you know, see those players that you've coached over the years and they come back to you five and 10 years later, that you've made a mark on them in a positive way that's helped them prepare for whatever they may face, to help them develop their skills, to support them when times are tough, to help them gain knowledge and wisdom so that they can share that wisdom onto somebody else, and then also to be that person of advice. You know, and I think this is the calling of a coach. We are their, their guide. We're their co-pilot. And too many times I've seen coaches get frustrated by a decision that a player makes to maybe leave or be unhappy. And our job as a coach is, is while we may be unhappy, we may feel like we are being rejected, is to see the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that they maybe need our support or ability to, to identify some of the risks of their decision making so that they can learn better down the road. So, you know, it always asks, it always hits me when I meet with coaches. You know, what's the most important coaching skill that we have? To me, it's the ability to connect to the people that we coach. I've worked with some amazing coaches that are the most technically proficient and successful coaches I've ever been around. They can break down the elements of the sport that they're coaching and the science behind it and the strategy and yet be unable to communicate with their team. Their team does not want to follow their lead. There was an old study that was done many years ago in the medical literature that looked at the differences between coaches, or excuse me, between physicians that had very, very good book smarts, technically proficient, and then they also uh, studied them on a level of bedside manner. And they looked at the risk of future malpractice. Now, we, we accept that there's got to be a minimum level of proficiency for a medical provider. We don't want somebody who is a terrible, terrible medical provider. Um, and so, but what they found in this study was that the individuals who had the highest level of medical proficiency, but were on the lower side of the bedside manner, had a high incidence of malpractice rates. But those that were maybe not as good medically, but had the bedside manner, had a much lower malpractice rate. Now, is that saying they weren't as good of physicians? Heck no. What that's saying is that many times the soft skill, the quote soft skills that we are attracted to as humans help us open the door for that some of that technical information. We can't overwhelm people because we're so tied in to the nature of the skill. We, we may know all that information out there in the coaching world. We may be able to know the different technical things that we geek out on. But our student that, or our player that sits in front of us wants you to connect to them. Many times a player comes to you as a team member. Many times a player comes to you for an individual session they may not want all that technical information. 
They just may want somebody to talk with them and make them feel better about themselves. Your job is to understand that. I'm going to talk about that mistake here in a little bit. But the best coaches are the ones that can connect and make each person feel special. Make each person feel like you are investing in them. Now, that's exhausting. There's no doubt about it. And particularly within this coaching crisis, particularly within an era of players who may be somewhat guarded, may have their defenses up, and may simply not want you to coach them. Players today have more than one coach in their ear. If you think about coaches today, when a player shows up to your team and your organization, they have enough information at their fingertips to reach any coach in the world to question and challenge what you're doing with them. That's a daunting perspective to have because at their fingertips, they may have five or six coaches that are invested with them on social media. They may have been from their travel ball organization. It may be from their seven on seven. It may be tournament organizers. It may be academic advisors, college placement individuals. There are so strength and conditioning, nutritionists, massage therapists. You're seeing more and more teams being put around and professionals like me being put around these athletes. And even on the professional ranks, not only are the coaches there, the coaches also have to work in a team of agents financial planners, um, spouses, significant others, partners, parents, and so on. So we as a, as a coach must understand not, not our role, but really a perspective of what, what we will see when we do this, what we will connect with when we're working with them. If you're in the business world and you're coaching individuals, what are the, who are the people that are in their ears? that are influencing their decisions. If they go on Glassdoor, which is a rating site of somebody's business setting and what it's like, they're going to come in with a pre-existing understanding of what that organization is like before they even experience anything. Our job as a coach is to make them feel that you are connecting with them at 100%. And more importantly, that you are part of their guide to take them through. Okay. Now, let's dive into the mistakes that we that I see. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail with each of them because you're going to get that in the ebook, but I'm going to go into some ideas and some examples. Number one is that people fall in love with the X's and the O's. We lack a philosophical direction. We allow our own ego to guide growth. We influence. We have too many outside in, in variables involved for you as a coach. Um, we get caught up in organizational disarray and chaos. We, our rules take precedent over standards, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more in depth, and we get impatient as coaches. And yet we preach that for our players. Don't get impatient. Stick with this. And yet we still get impatient. All right, let's talk about the first one. This is the single largest mistake that I make, that I see. If our coaches, if you today would study human behavior across multiple different perspectives at a rate that is equal to the technical proficiencies of your domain, you would be a rock star. I want to repeat that again. If you would study psychology, human behavior, at the rate that you study your technical proficiencies, you would be a rock star. Here's why. You already have, unless you've entered your sport, team, or organization as a complete novice, which I would say is highly unlikely, unless you are entering, you have, a, without any information or experience in the sport, you have a certain level of technical proficiency because you probably competed or have been around the sport long enough that you have a, a nice knowledge base. But connecting to other individuals, as I talked about, removes us from falling in love with the X's and O's and realizes that you can't scheme your way through a victory as much as you can inspire one. You can't, it's not all or nothing. We already live in a world that's too all or nothing. We have to live in the continuum. We move. And what your job as a coach is to understand, what is the right balance between communicating the X's and O's with also making people believe 
that they can achieve. I was very fortunate enough to be around the greatest baseball coach to ever coach in college baseball and Skip Bertman. And coach used to say, whether you're with me for a year or five, you're going to leave here with a PhD in baseball. Well, there was a lot of truth to that. And the truth to it was that um, we, you know, we knew that we were going to learn the aspects of the game that other people would not. And we understood the game, but he taught us the interpretation of the game that was much different. We didn't think about indicators that got other people tied up and concerned. More importantly, we focused on the elements that separated us, that gave us the advantage that other people didn't focus on. He didn't teach us how to put our hand on the ground to field a ground ball unless we needed it. Instead, he focused on having the strategic how to win awareness to get the, the angle to see the opportunity to exploit the differential from our opponent. See, it wasn't so much about the X's and O's as it was our belief that we had an advantage over our competition on the X's and O's that mattered. That's what I want you to understand as a coach. I want you to go deeper than the simple X's and O's. I want you to create players at every level of your organization, whether you're an individual coach or you coach a team, that they understand the game at a higher level so that they become wiser, more resourceful to understand it. Wisdom ne- or yeah, wisdom never hurts us. Ignorance is one of the greatest problems that we have. Ignorance is just the lack of knowing. It's not choosing to f- focus on inaccurate information. It's the fact that we don't know what the correct information is. Our job as a coach is while the X's and O's, X's and O's are important, it's knowing how I execute them to gain an angle. Some of the most successful coaches may be the most simple. Why is that? Yeah, gymnastics. Oh, I forgot. I knew I forgot one was on the pole. Thank you. I knew I'd forgotten one, and I it was on the top of it was the actual the motivation as to why I started it. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, but it's just like let's use gymnastics as an example. The X's and O's are critical. The technical proficiencies but getting somebody to believe that they can do it. And yet what do we do oftentimes is we harp, we harp, we harp on the individual elements because we can see it. They can't. In baseball, I've seen way too many coaches in softball working on the individual elements of a swing or a throwing motion that just absolutely locks the mind up of the competitor when sometimes we'd be better off with a little bit of inefficiency and slowly work the efficiencies in there, but keeping the belief of them high. Let's not fall in love with the X's and O's and the technology and the technical processes. Instead, let's empower them to believe in their heart and their soul that they can do it. But that starts with connecting to them, understanding who they are, understanding what's important for them. Don't overwhelm them with information if they're not ready. Don't overwhelm them. Remember, I always say this, John Wooden's first meetings with his team, he'd sit down and he would teach them how to tie their shoes and put on their socks so they didn't have blisters. Okay. Don't be afraid to teach them. Don't be afraid to show them. I've always said coaches should always in the college world should spend time teaching their athletes table manners and etiquette. It's a skill that will last a lifetime, but too many people are afraid to do that because we're afraid we're going to upset them. Or you just teach everybody. I'm going to teach you how to sit at a table because when I go eat sometimes with teams and I look around at the, the table etiquette, I'm most, most horrified by the coach's etiquette. But if you're going to go meet with somebody, a big booster, you're going to meet, do a job interview and you're shoveling the food in, that's not a good sign. So coaches, don't get caught up on how good you are on the X's and O's. Be a master of human behavior. Number two, lack of philosophical direction. This is a huge, huge thing. And if you're part of my Catalyst Live group, you know this. That philosophy guides coaching success. 
too many coaches, if I ask, how many of you have a philosophy? They all raise their hand. How many of you have it written down? Less than 5 or 10%. I want to make that 100% out of 100 every single time. I never want to see a coach not having it written down. With all the technology that we have, even iPads, start and write it down. We're going to develop a way to develop to, to uh, account for and write down your philosophical direction. But as a coach, it's as simple as how do you develop players? If you're a basketball coach, what are your inbound plays? What are your defense or your press defense? If you're a gymnastics coach, how do you coach the beam versus the vault versus the bars? What do you look for and how you develop your players? What do you look for in developing a player to go from J-O to college? How do you, Write all that down and start it. Yes, it's daunting. Yes, it's overwhelming. Yes, it's scary. But can you imagine the greatest chefs in this world not having their recipes written down? That is your intellectual property, is your ability. People made fun of Ed Orgeron when he got the job at LSU because when they went into the interview, they went in with a binder. That binder laid out their game plan for how they were going to develop coaching at that level. People doubted. I don't think people are doubting anymore. He had an organizational vision of years and years of experience being around tremendous coaches that he had collected over the years. That's his blueprint for developing a championship-level program. Write it down and keep it in a binder and every year improve it. Those coaches who lack philosophical direction will fall for the newest, fastest thing ever. And I see this a lot. Coaches go to a conference. They have an amazing speaker who comes in. And the next thing you know, they want to do everything that that speaker said. They want to change what they're doing. Oh, I, I learned about this. I want to do this. Versus before we throw out the baby with the bathwater, can we evaluate our program every year? Can we come in and do a complete audit of our program? If you're in the travel ball organizations, if you own a gym, if you train individuals, if you're a high school coach, a college coach, or a professional coach, every year you should have an audit of your program where you take the time after your season, before you, whenever your natural break is, and spend the time doing a complete audit. That self-awareness is critical for your long-term success. It, it, it may be painful to see what you're, where you're falling short, but if you focus on the things that you're doing well, more than likely, there's many more factors there that you're doing extremely well that we can improve. Okay. Whew. Number three. Whew. Yow. Sometimes we allow our ego to guide our growth. Sometimes we allow our ego to guide our growth as coaches. It's a powerful position to be responsible for the success of people that we lead. No doubt about it. Sometimes our ego is driven by the need to be liked, the need to be valued, to be seen as successful. Dr. Brene Brown is one of the best writers out there. She speaks on vulnerability quite often. It's how she kind of, I don't want to say made her name. Her name was known before that, but to the general public, that's what she was known for, daring greatly and the vulnerability behind it. See, our ego protects us. It's not a terrible thing because we have to have some self-belief, but our ego often sparks defense mechanisms. I'm going to talk about that in Catalyst Live real soon. It's going to be very, very powerful, but the power of understanding self-belief is not about ego. Self-belief is I can face the challenges before me. Ego is that self-directed, overvalued sense of self that limits our ability to learn, grow, and develop. The number of times that I've seen coaches be very limited because they refuse to listen to outside sources, which is funny because that's an upcoming sin, but they don't develop and bring people in that they can learn from. One of the coaches that I love Patrick Murphy, who's the head softball coach at the University of Alabama, he attends the American Baseball Coaches Association. Now, he's a baseball geek, but as a softball coach, he goes to the baseball convention. 
How many baseball coaches go to the softball convention? Why do you think that number is extremely, extremely low? See, one of the brilliant, or one of the, the brilliant, it wasn't brilliant, one of the motivating factors to why I created Catalyst Live was that I could bring multiple people in from multiple different sports and different backgrounds and genres so that you can learn from them. So basketball coaches can learn from golf coaches. Golf coaches can learn from tennis coaches. Tennis coaches can learn from a football coach and a, and a football coach can learn from a swimming coach. And business leaders can learn from all of those. See, what we coach is just simply how we apply our trade. The fact that you are a coach is your vocation. What I want you to understand is your ego is important, but make sure your ego does not hamper your personal or professional growth. Be a seeker of information. You can have a little bit of critical eye, maybe even a little skeptical eye. But if you're working on that first sin, which is or second sin, which is the philosophical aspect of things, you can bring in information and have a way to evaluate it. I've asked my college coaches before, you have brilliance on your college campus. You have diversity at every level. Why don't we bring in our professors and our teaching aides and our provosts and things like that to, to speak to our teams? Now, I know that there's limitations but wow, from time, but wow, we could bring in some unbelievable speakers. They're right there. The biggest thing that we have to do as coaches is ask for help. Number four, now... I just said, I want you to bring in better speakers, better influences, better videos. But yet the fourth sin is the influence of too many outside variables. What I mean from that is a coaching standpoint. Don't become, don't allow your decision-making to be influenced by who provides you the money from an outside fundraising source. Okay, I understand finances are critical. I understand we have bosses. My bosses are my clients, in addition to my wife. But you still have to make decisions. And as long as your intentions are pure, they're empirically supported, they're validated by years of experience, and you go through a decision tree, you're ultimately the decision maker. I find too many coaches worried about what a possible recruit may think. I mean, we're not talking about inappropriate comments. We're just talking about decision making. You know, I've seen coaches struggle with being able to you know, coach a player and be honest with the player because they're afraid that that player may run back to their travel ball coach and share that they weren't being liked. If there's not a framework for giving feedback and you're not able to have honest conversations, you're being influenced by outside variables and the what if. You also need to educate your administrators, your boosters, your parents on a regular basis of what your responsibilities are and what your process is. You are not guided and driven by those outside variables. They are a part of your life, but they are not who you answer to. You answer ultimately to those you lead. You invite those around you in your administration, even if they're your boss, to be a part of your journey. You respect them, but you answer to those coaches. You have responsibility and accountability to doing things the right way from an ethical and, and um, integrity standpoint. But at the end of the day, you have to make the decisions of what you feel is right. It may not always be positive. It may not always be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, popular. But it is the decision that you have to make because more than likely you have more information than anyone else. If you're not allowing ego to guide your growth and you are openly and actively collecting information, you'll be pretty wise in your decision making. That's what I want to make sure that you do. Number five, coaches, your organization needs to be in order. If you're not an organized person like me, then you need to have somebody in your organization that is and empower them to keep the cupboards clean, keep the equipment room organized to handle business appropriately and send emails out. Organizational disarray and chaos steals energy from your ability to coach. 
golf coaches, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. I walk in a golf coach's bay. I look around and I start having chest pain. It's cluttered many times. And more than likely, many of the tools that you have in there, you haven't used in six months. Put them somewhere else. You imagine walking into a surgeon's office and the magazine that's sitting on the chair is from six months ago, eight months ago, and it's got coffee stains on it. It's got an old Kleenex on it. Coaches in college, coaches in high school, be organized, have practice plans ready. Every single coach should have developmental plans for their players, not winging it. Like, oh yeah, let me tell you what it's about. No, that's organizational disarray and chaos. That means you're not prepared and you're overwhelmed. You need to take the time and be disciplined to plan your practice, communicate what you're going to do, share with your players on a regular basis their developmental plan. Doesn't mean you have to break their, their hope. Educate them, teach them, share with them. Make them a part of your plans. Give them clear understanding of what's around the corner. I don't believe that coaches should surprise teams or players on training because most players are trying to figure out what they need to do to make it through the training. They want to know, this is what I'm going to do today. If you're not organized, you're winging it. You don't want your players to wing it in competition, do you? Well, then don't wing it with them. Be organized. Get your stuff in order. Get notebooks. Get organized. There's great, there's great free webinars online on time management. Organization. We're all busy. We're all busy. We got to be better. Okay. One of the things that happens when we've lost control of an organization is we implement rules instead of standards. Sometimes we have to have rules. Sometimes we have to have rules about how we do things. But one of the biggest problems we have in today's society is we don't explain why things are important. We tell our kids, be home at 10. They don't understand why they need to be home at 10. So of course, if they don't understand the rationale and the motivation behind it, they're going to try to push the limit. So what do we do? The only way we enforce the rules is we increase our punishment. Oh, <sighs> so now the punishments have to rise to a point of being painful enough. We have to restrict them. We can't let them out of the house for two weeks, right? But if they had the standards, what does it mean to be home at 10 so that I can be home before people who are leaving the bars can get on the road? Oh, that makes sense. I can understand that. Um, why is it important for us to be on the bus before the time of departure? Okay. Well, if a play, if a bus is having to wait on a player or two, then what we're showing is that your time is more valuable than our team's time. So can you leave your bus with your star player sitting at home? I hope you can. Because if not, all you're doing is establishing rules that people don't buy in. I'm not saying we, we need to be ruleless. Never would I say that. But you have to explain the rationale and the motivation. Coaches, you should go through at the beginning of the year why it's important. Golf coaches, if you're asked, if your session swing lesson is for somebody at four o'clock and they get there at four o'clock, you're going to take the first 10 or 15 minutes with them to get loose. If you explain to them, listen, I'd like you here at 340 if you possibly can to get loose. I'm going to do everything in my power to be there and ready at four o'clock. That way we maximize our time together and I am ready for you. But if I'm going to wait for you to get loose, then I'm, you're going to lose my mental focus and I'm not going to be as ready or as good because I have things I want to do with you. Okay. Um, coaches, if leaders in business, if you don't send out your agenda 24 hours ahead of a meeting, coaches, if you don't have a regular agenda for your coaches meeting that is sent out 24 hours ahead of time, the first five minutes of getting the agenda, everybody's looking at it to, to see if they're on it and if they're prepared for it. Send it ahead of time and prepare people mentally for what they're about to go through. You can also provide homework or provide assignments so people are ready and it stays on path. Rules have punishments. Standards, well, if we are all bought into our program, a, a failure of our standard hurts the overall program. 
our, my coach used to sit at the beginning of the year and talk about why it was our job to maintain the integrity and the, and the cleanliness of our ballpark. Because he said two things. One, it shows that you're disciplined to the little things, that you care enough about where you perform that you want other people to see it and value it. Number two, there's nothing better than seeing the opposing team get off the bus and win the battle already. When they look around at the ballpark and they're mesmerized by the cleanliness of the bathrooms, then you've already got the head on the head start on them. Because by winning that little thing, they're starting to think, we don't do that. So they're that much better. I hate seeing teams get dressed on the sidelines, see teams get dressed in the dugout. Golfers put on their shoes out on the thing. Show up ready to go. Those are standards. But you as a coach need to develop it. Don't make it so that it is like you're living in this authoritative nature. Explain to them why it's important. Do they have any idea why you do X over Y over Z? That's the brilliance of it. Right? If I told my kids when they were younger, do your homework when you get home, they say, oh, but I'm so tired. I don't want to do it. If you said, hey, do your homework when you get off the bus because tonight we're going to go see a show, they would do it. See, you have to explain to them why, but if they're having to wait to some, we can't go. Explain it to them. They'll buy in. If they don't, sometimes you do need to have rules, Right? Sometimes we have to have rules that are for the betterness of people. I mean, you can't drink and drive. That's a rule. That's not a standard. Okay. Because people who are impaired can't, they have to have a punishment strong enough to deter behavior. But, you know, we know that seatbelts save lives. But do you realize that the data on seatbelts didn't change human behavior? It wasn't until there was a punishment strong enough that they could stop you as a primary offense and give you a ticket that cost you money, that it started changing behavior. Okay, so sometimes we need rules, but standards have the consequences that we as a team that's bought in don't wanna have to deal with. So let's get to the core of why behavior varies, and then that becomes a standard that is carried on for generations, and you as a coach, you don't need to enforce them anymore. Your team already does it for you. Number seven. Whew, I see this a lot. Coaches, you're developing a career in coaching. If you start coaching when you're 25 and you, grad, you graduate, you retire when you're in your late 60s, it's over 40 years of coaching. Just because you're not having the success that you want or you're not at the salary you want or you're not at the level you want when you're 35, be patient. Keep growing and developing. Okay, there are outliers in our field. We have to trust the process, the philosophy, and the system for when it's ready. And if we struggle and we don't have early success, we need to evaluate our process, but we have to continue to develop the process to be better and better and better. The time will come. Think about like farming land. You plant the seeds, right? And if I'm the wise farmer, because I got the gray beard, if I'm the wise farmer and you're the young farmer, you can have all the science and technology you want. And I go, yeah, you know what? We plant the corn now and it comes up four months later. I don't know. I'm not a farmer. But it comes up four months later. Okay? The young, the young gun, he or she says, oh, but see, my science says this. I've done this a lot. I, I know when it's coming up. You plant the seeds. Now's the hand wringing time, right? Well, you can look at all the data you want. I have years and years of experience. Okay. I may have missed once or twice, but I've got a pretty good understanding. You don't go out there and disturb the ground to see if the seeds are growing. You trust that they're going to push through at the right time. But remember this. Before we had fertilizer, they fertilized the land with cow manure. So you got to put push through a lot of crap to see the growth of your, to be ready to be harvested when it's time for you. We all are running a different race. We all have a different start and finish line. 
right? There may be times that you're successful and you quote lost that power position. You lost a job, you lost an opportunity, you got beat, you lost a championship. Rebuild for the reemergence and become continuous, continually reinvesting in your growth and development. You have the opportunity to put faith, hope, you know, belief in so many people you work with. The Buddha, is, is, Buddha has been quoted saying, how many candles can a lit candle light? The answer is infinite. You're a candle. You're a catalyst for growth. So let me ask you a question. Do you coach? Do you lead from a place of fear of what could happen or of purpose? I can deal with what will happen. As long as our intentions are pure, we're focused on philosophy and a desire, let's get rid of the fear and let's do it with purpose. See, I just finished this book. If you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it. And it is long. Okay. I listened to it. Um, and it, it's, it was brilliant. It's about the USS Indianapolis, which was torpedoed at near the end of world war II in the Philippine sea. What drew my attention to it was I love the Pacific theater of the world war II. I'm fascinated by it. Um, but I lived in the Philippines, so I'd been to Corregidor, and I'd, you know, I, I just fascinated by it. The end, the men that, that had to abandon ship when the torpedoes hit had to jump into the ocean. They stayed in the ocean for four days. Some on make, make believe, make believe made up rafts, but some just wading in the water, heavily shark infested, lost many men to sharks. Many of their dead bodies were taken away by sharks. But what happened was the actual captain of the ship survived. I'm not going to go into the details, but the captain of the ship was court-martialed because of decisions that were made in that time. It was a really, really unjust decision and process by the U.S. Navy at the time. They were covering the bases on a couple other factors that where they had some breakdowns and processes. It took 50 years to exonerate him. But what was interesting was all he wanted was the trust and love of the people that he led. He felt that he did made the decisions that were right. He couldn't overcome the decision. He couldn't influence the decisions that the Navy made. They had predetermined what they made about him. But what, what Captain McVeigh, who was the captain of the ship as a leader, as a coach, as a catalyst, it didn't go his way. He lost a ship. He lost about a thousand men and he got court-martialed. But he stood true that the decisions that he made came from a place of being educated in the circumstances that he was in. And I don't think he would have done anything different. I'm not saying that we want us to be on a sinking ship. Being a leader is hard. Being a coach is brutally hard. I remember sitting down with Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC, and we're sitting in this office and I said, Commissioner Sankey, nobody understands what it's like to sit in that chair. And he said, until you sit in that chair, you have no idea. The job that you have as a coach is hard. There's a lot of experts in the stands and on social media, but you have to understand to not be influenced by those outside sources and make the decisions with the people in front of you. You are ultimately a catalyst. Okay. You're a person that causes change or action in another immediately. I want to give you this. Um, I want to give you the slides on the presentation, but the, uh, or the um, seven sins book. But before I do that, I've got an offer for you. Okay. What motivated the seven sins was the fact that led to the catalyst live. These are the weekly coaching calls that I do. Listen, it's under $20 a month. You get four live coaching sessions a month. If there are people on this call that, that are there, you can put it in the chat. If you like it, I think it's great. Okay. I love it. It is the most fun that I have. I am running the offer now to you. It's not a sales call. I'm just telling you, coaches, you need resources. Not only do we have live coaching calls, we're about to launch conversations with where I'm going to bring in experts across the fields, outside of coaching, public relations, race relations, legal issues. And we're going to have conversations that you're going to sit in on. 
I want to be the source for coaches to grow and become the best catalyst you possibly can. I want you to be a part of this. I need you to be a part of it. Thanks, Jake. Highly recommend. Um, yeah, you know, I, I want you to become the coach you're destined to be by having the support around you. I believe in this so strongly because it's one affordable, it's $20 a month for live coaching, just like this, prepared and ready to go. Okay. So take advantage of that. If you want the, thank you, Tina. I appreciate that. If you want the, the seven sins book, here it comes right now. I've shared it with you. It's in the process of sharing. It'll come to your information. It's right there. The seven sins coaching ebook. You should, you should have it. And I will keep that up while we get through. So the Catalyst School Live, weekly coaching sessions. Once I figure out technology, we're going to be even better. But it's hours of past trainings that are always available to you, always in a library, always available. Okay, we do them at different times of the day to try to make sure we hit everybody. I'm always available. Okay, so it's, it's very inexpensive, $19.95 a month. And if you sign up in the next 90 minutes, you'll get a free seven-day trial. What do you have to lose? Guess what? There's one in the next 24 hours that you can sign up for. It's completely free. And so if you sign up on mobile, it's right below you. If you're on desktop, it's right to my right when you're looking at the screen. Okay. So here's some of our social media testimonials. I appreciate people who have shared. They've made me better. Um, it's, listen, a great teaching environment. Most of you are teachers. Well, I'd say all of y'all are teachers. Okay. I meant like went to school to be a teacher. Um, I didn't. We understand how we get information. We learn through a lot of sources. I want to get these sources out there. I want to get us to be better. I want to bring you coaches that have been in the dumps and have overcome it. I want those that are on top that are continuing to win information. Great information. Okay. This is brilliant stuff. I need you to join. I want to create a revolution of the most empowered and successful and wisest coaches that we can because we have the impact to change our culture to raise smart, empathetic, caring individuals that can dominate in their sports, dominate in the classroom, and dominate in the workforce. And if you're a business, listen, I know firsthand how hard it is to have great people. I've screwed up more employees than I've helped, okay? Um, and I say that humbly, right? Um, we got to know the psychology of the people that we lead. If we don't, we're going to fail them. So I'm going to turn over to the chat. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer it. Make sure you follow me on social media, please, 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 please. Um, because that's how a lot of my interactions go. And I'm always available for DMs. Um, you can go to the catalystschool.com or brettmccabe.com for more information. So please take advantage of that. I really appreciate it. I'm in the poll, which is so we had 57% on the call. Golf coaches got my member guest this week. Hope I play well. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over. If you have any chat questions, I will answer them. When it comes to philosophy, would also benefit for the players to, yes, to benefit a, to, to create a personal philosophy, something that, guides them more forward on a more personal level. Yes. Over time, I think every player should have a personal competitive philosophy. But a lot of times our players don't know what that is first and foremost, and they're intimidated by just solving the problem in front of them. So I think as part of your developmental plan for your players, I would absolutely have the process of developing the way that they approach things. I believe that there are different philosophy, there are different personalities that face competition. Part of that is understanding who you are. What are those different personality styles? And I talk about that in Catalyst Live a lot, and I'm going to do an entire workshop on it here real soon. But is helping developing um, a trust and understanding of how to define who they are. Um, and you know, I think that's important is to help them develop it. Had a question. Um, you mentioned 24 hours send out for agendas for meetings. How far in advance would you recommend sending practice plans? Um, if your players show up for practice every day to like a locker room, I'd have it posted there before they go out in the competitive environment. I think that's completely fine. I've seen too many coaches who 
hold the practice plan like this and then they don't tell anybody. Um, and what happens is every player who's gassed, winded, tired, ready to go home is thinking how much more is on that sheet, right? But if I know what I've got to do, I know how to plan my resources. I think if you've got a maybe a hard run or a hard physical training, I think it's okay to say tomorrow we're going to do this. It gives them a chance to think about it. How do you get the seven-day trial, uh, Laura? You just sign up for the Catalyst School. You'll get seven days. And before seven days is up, if you cancel, then you can um, do that. Um, yes, Aaron, yes. Hand each golfer their own practice plan. I think it's great. And as with golfers, one of the things that I would do is I would work with them on developing practice plans with them so that soon they get to a spot where they're empowered enough to share with you and they send it to you 24 hours or my players, I try to get them to do it a week ahead of time, um, you know, is, is, is to, to, to take that ownership of their own developmental plan. And from a golf standpoint, since there's so many golf coaches on here, I don't like to see irons, woods, tell me what you're going to do. Tell me how many balls and what are the parameters? Um, let's see. There was, if I understand it correctly, the best windy, the, the, if I understood you correctly, the best problem to solve is what separates the player from everyone else. Um, I mean, I think, let me understand that. If I understand, if I understood you correctly, the best problem to solve is what separates the, yeah, is to get to know their uniqueness and their individuality, right? One, one of my players said it perfect. You know, with Brett, the way you do things is that you don't make me think this is what I need to do. You make me believe that what I do is the right thing. And I'm not having to use mental energy to do something else. Okay. I want them to realize, look, we all have a psychological fingerprint. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different belief systems. We all have different experiences. We all have drama and trauma in our background. We also have hopes, dreams, beliefs, right? I've never told a player that I didn't think that they couldn't succeed because who am I to say that, right? So I think if you can get them to understand what makes them different, what's their advantage, to believe in that unique strength that they have and to find that angle and that chip on the shoulder, that's brilliant. H have I ever seen this stat? 1979, Harvard, 84% no goals, 13% goals in their head, 0.3%. Specific and written down, 1989, 13 earned us twice as much. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, we're in the process of building a house right now. Can you imagine if our builder went out there and just said, huh? I think I'm just going to put a, build, a wall over there, right? We have plans, we have ideas, and they're based on years and years of experience. Um, and, you know, I think having that goal and that game plan of where we're going, imagine taking off and, and the airplane just says, we're going west. Well, where? Seattle's a lot different than San Diego. I need to know. Um, how would you help a player that is struggling? Um, the, uh, a player that is struggling is a unique experience and a unique journey. Okay. Um, a lot of times we see the struggle on the field as a symptom of a struggle that they're having. Is the struggle from lack of belief? Is it bad probabilities that they're just in a bad struggle zone? Is the struggle because of um, they're in a time of not understanding? So one of the things I try to do is get them to understand and then also focus on the incremental growth. Players lose patience because they also see the position and the success of everyone else around them moving faster than them. But what they don't realize is a lot of times in success, we're up and down as we're moving up, okay? So when somebody else is surging and they're dropping back, they feel like they're losing ground, but they don't realize that that other person is going to drop at some point too, and they got to be ready for the surge. So I try to give them a picture, but I always, always have players that are struggling do two things. Journal so that they can uh, separate emotion from their assessment and also, I want them to chart their progress. Okay. All righty. Well, I hope everybody has a great day and night. Continues to be a Catalyst. I hope to see you on Catalyst Live. I hope you download the Seven Sins book. It's free. It's there for you. It's fantastic. Um, it's well put together by Brett Basham, my teammate. Um, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your life. Thank you for allowing me to trust you guys to trust me to be here. Um, here's the other thing I'll tell you. We live in unique times. We've been through a lot this year. We're continuing to go through a lot. Love, support, listen, don't correct, engage. Here's the greatest thing that I learned when I was a kid. Tell me your story. I want to hear from you. Tell me what you believe. Listen, don't judge, don't correct. 
inspire, engage, and listen. They'll always remember you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and y'all have a great one. Take care.